hello everyone and welcome to today's session and uh, i mean uh, i have with me today a very big personality a person who is who has mastered the uh, act of actually closing tech positions and she's worked with a variety of companies she's worked with top companies like microsoft like uh, a few startups and uh, i mean we're glad to have her today and before starting off uh, i'd like you guys to introduce this platform this platform is called as go to webinar and uh, on the panel we have a questions tab in which you can ask your questions at any point of time so please uh, feel free to ask any questions that you have so for a check right now maybe if a few of you can write yes in that question section so that we know that uh, it works well okay fine i see a lot of yeses coming in perfect so we'll start off uh, today's session. I have a small presentation about Hacker Earth and what we do, post which uh, I'll switch over the prize to the much more beautiful lady in the house, uh, Domina, who will take over today's session. So quickly. So uh, tech skills is one of the most valued global currency and organizations are actually betting on it pretty much. Uh, all companies are moving towards being software-based companies and long back in 2013 one of uh, of the famous uh, philosophers uh, mark anderson said that software is eating the world and it's actually turning out to be true because uh, every company be it uh, a small company uh, a startup uh, a large enterprise like a netflix google facebook amazon or a small startup like airbnb which has grown massively to uh, non-traditional computer software companies like uh, Walmart Labs and FedEx. Trust me, all of these companies are turning to software companies and they require software engineers at the end of the day. Now, this is the major problem that we have. It is really difficult to identify and hire talented developers. I mean, they're out there, but the market is really competitive and people have a lot of things on their resumes, but, uh, you only want the best, obviously. Everyone wants uh, to have the best developers in their team. Technical recruiting is pretty hard. It takes around 50 to 60 days uh, to close a position, 10,000 hours in screening, six rounds of um, assessments, including interviews. And the last point, a very shocking fa uh, factor here, I would say, yeah. Uh, the average cost to hire is as high as $30,000. So for one hire, traditionally, recruiters would take like $30,000. A few challenges that recruiters around the globe are facing. Uh, one of them is assessing the candidates while saving costs, obviously. Identifying the top candidates. You don't want um, maybe people who have fancy resumes, but they don't have the exact skills when it comes to uh, closing a position in your organization. So you require the person to have the right skills. Understand the expectations of a candidate, very important. It's a totally candidate-driven market these days. Candidates have multiple offers in hand. Uh, you have to make them join your company. So you have to understand the expectation of the candidate as well. Last but not the least, uh, battle with remote hiring. You might have the top developers sitting miles away from your office location, but again, you don't want to miss out on them. So you have to make sure that you have uh, a, a kind of a strategy in which you inculcate remote hiring as well. This is where we help you. This is where Hacker Earth comes into the picture. And we help you assess developers across the globe. So using our platform, you can reduce your time to hire developer, uh, deliver a great candidate experience because our platform is developed by developers. Our co-founders are both developers. So they, they know what it exactly takes to you know, make a developer happy when it comes to coding obviously improve your quality of hires and scale your hiring across roles. So this is the hacker difference. Uh, if a lot of customers say that the time to hire is reduced significantly, one of the stats is 50% and the quality of hires, very important factor. It has improved by 60%. Here we have a few testimonials. And as you can see that most of these, uh, actually all the three companies are not computer software companies. They happen to be companies of different industries and yet they require software developers. This is our customer base, uh, a lot of big names there. And I mean, we would love to have your company as well. I would suggest that each one of you today who we have for this webinar, please try out Hacker Earth once and you'll know the difference. 
This is the platform at a glance. We have an AI based test creation. We have a question library of close to 13,000 questions. You can either use those questions or have your own questions on the platform. And we can assess 500 plus skills, 35 plus languages, and also six plus spoken languages. So it's not just English, it includes English, Russian, Spanish, German, Japanese, and we're adding a few more there. We have a robust proctoring settings in which uh, the candidate cannot cheat. We make sure that the candidate is actually, you know, um, showing his skills. It's not someone who can help him from the back. So we have advanced uh, AI powered uh, proctoring settings. And one more feature that we have is remote video interviews in which you can conduct interviews for your candidates sitting at their homes maybe. And the last point, very important for hiring managers and analytics and in-depth analytics of um the candidate performance as to how the candidate has performed so that you can you know have the best on with that i conclude my presentation and i guess all of you might be waiting for our guest speaker today who is one of the top recruiters when it comes to recruiting tech candidates she's from microsoft and i don't actually need to introduce her because a lot of you already know her so domino over to you and guys if you have any questions throughout the session please feel free to ans uh, ask them in the questions tab uh, i'll be monitoring them personally and whenever a question comes up i'll make sure we address it with domino all right hello everyone i'm super excited to be partnering with hacker earth on my favorite recruiting topic here closing so i'm damina mcquade like arbaz said i'm the lead recruiter for data centers at microsoft globally and uh, today we'll be going through everything I've learned about the five W's of closing and how to close tech talent. All right, so before we get rolling, I figured you guys might wanna know a little bit about me if you don't know me already. So a quick bio, I'm a pilot turned recruiter, uh, kind of rare, uh, a little bit of an interesting career path. We'll save that for another day. I'm a mom to a three-year-old little girl who's charismatic and a little crazy. I am married to a sales guy. He's one of the, the ways I get a lot of closing techniques. Uh, and I also have a Wheaton Terrier, so I'm a dog mom. Um, to my professional experience, like I said, I'm uh, the lead recruiter for data centers at Microsoft. It's a really fun and exciting place to recruit because data centers span the entire globe at Microsoft. Um, there's a huge variety of roles. Um, you know, anything from like rack and stack people to real estate, construction. I handle all the principal and director roles for, for data centers. Um, and data centers are just so crucial to Microsoft because without data centers, there'd be no cloud. And Azure's our money maker, right? Um, I've got seven years of recruiting experience, mostly tech recruiting, but I've also done non-tech. Um, I've recruited a ton of software engineers, TPMs, SREs, content developers cloud advocates. I recently did a stretch role where I managed a team of design recruiters for all of Microsoft, which was really fun. And then I just moved over to data center, like I mentioned recently. Uh, fun fact I looked up for, for this presentation is I've actually closed well over 500 candidates. So like I said, I am really excited to share what I've learned, uh, mostly through trial and error. Uh, probably mostly air, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And one thing I wanted to note before I get rolling is there are many, many ways to close. I think Arbaz said it perfectly where it's more of an art versus a science. And so I've seen people be really successful when they're super direct, or I've seen styles where recruiters buddy up with the candidate and try to be their friend and advocate. So what I'll be sharing today is really my style and what I found that works for me. All right, so let's get into it. Actually, before we get into this, um, I think Arbaz, we had some polling questions. Uh, do you wanna do those really fast? Yeah, so we'll quickly run through a poll. So, uh, okay, so for the first question, uh, to have an essence of who we have as the audience today, as Domina would love to know, cause she has different points for different designations, I would say. So here's a poll for you guys, uh, get voting. Cool, so it looks like the bulk of who's here is recruiters and sourcers. 
um, but also some hiring managers, CEOs, and other. Great. Yes, so I guess almost everyone has voted, so it's almost 82% uh, are recruiters, 4% are hiring managers, 6% are CEO, CTOs, engineering managers, and 8% others as well. Perfect, perfect. Cool. So now I guess you have your result here for the audience that we have. Perfect, great. I'll tailor it mostly to recruiters, and um, but I'll also talk to the other people here as well throughout. Awesome, so, sorry about that. So why I chose closing, our first W of the day. Um, when Arbaz approached me to do a webinar, I was really excited and he let me pick the topic. I chose closing because it's become such a competitive market. You know, unemployment is low, wages are going up, tech companies are growing, and it's caused just a super competitive env environment at offer stage. Um, you know, I read a stat that the average software engineer has three competitive offers when they're looking for a new job. And it's the number one challenge I hear from recruiters. Um, it's a, a huge hallway topic uh, in our hallways is, you know, what's working, what's not working, what can we try differently? And I think that closing has just become a super crucial skill to landing top talent in this environment. Um, plus, like I mentioned already, it's, it's my favorite part of recruiting. So, all right, let's get into the meat of it. So who to target? Um, rather than starting at the very end, at the close, I want to back it up to the very beginning. This is crucial because if you're not targeting the right type of talent, then you're setting yourself up for failure at the close. And what I mean by that is if you're targeting candidates that are out of reach or too expensive or would not move to your company or for your role, then you're just wasting recruiter time, hiring manager time, uh, and the candidate's time. So focusing on who to target is a really important part at the close. Um, so first step there is understanding the tech market. And what I mean by that is have a general idea of what's going on at big four tech companies. You know, uh, what are what is their pay like? What is their titles? How do their titles map to your company? What are their benefits like? What are the pros for working at a big four company? What are the cons? Um, same thing with a mid-sized company or non-tech companies or, you know, startups. Um, another thing to look at is what, what companies are in your local area that you're competing with. Look at your exact competitors um, and just, just understand that market. Um, second piece is find out where your company stacks up. You know, are, when it comes to pay, are you the highest paid? Are you the lowest? Are you somewhere in the middle? Um, when it comes to benefits, is that a, an incentive for people to move to your company? Or is it something that you're gonna have to overcome because they're not as great as the competitive market? Um, Work-life balance and flexibility, things like that. Um, if you don't know where you stack in the market and what your value add is, it's almost impossible to sell to a candidate. So make sure that you're really clear on what your edge is over the comp competition. Um, I'm gonna skip this one for one second. I'll circle back. Um, third box here is one mistake I see a lot of recruiters do is they, they get their open role and they focus only on that open role rather than looking at the big picture. One thing I changed probably about five years ago in my recruiting is I start with big picture. So I understand what are the business goals, right? What are what kind of product or service are they trying to deliver? Um, what is the timeline for that? You know, do they have to hire 100 software engineers by X date or that product won't launch? If that's the case, as a recruiter, you need to know that. Um, you need to know how recruiting fits into that puzzle. Uh, I think that starting there, it number one, gives you credibility with the business. And it also, it gives you intel to help sell the candidates later down the line, because um, you're not going to know just about that role. You'll know about possible growth paths and kind of the big picture of what's going on and be able to speak to that. Um, next box here is finding out what the talent gaps are on the team. So, you know, what skill sets do they not have right now that they need? Is there some kind of deep domain knowledge that would be very valuable to this team? Or, you know, do they just need the volume and, and more good engineers. Um, you kind of need to know what exactly their, their pain points are and their needs and how to prioritize things. Um, I'm going to skip over here to talent insights. I don't know how many recruiters here 
um, have used Talent Insights. I just started using it about a year ago, and it is one of the coolest tools that has given me so much credibility and made me a more efficient recruiter. Um, basically, what it does is it draws trends on every single person on LinkedIn. So um, what you can do is, uh, let's say you have your profile and you need 100 of them. You can look at what the total talent pool size is for that talent. Um, you can look at location, what competitors are hiring that talent. Um, I love the hidden gems function. And what hidden gems is, is it's where there's a high concentration of that talent, but the candidates are getting a low amount of in-mails. So that means your chances for response on your in-mail are higher. Your chances to get them to interview with your company are higher, um, things like that. So really good tool. And again, I think having that data-driven approach with your orgs or your hiring managers, it again gives you credibility. Um, the last box here is the must-haves versus the nice-to-haves. This is really important. You need to know what are the deal breakers for your hiring manager or your team and what are they flexible on and why that's important is you need to know if you need to widen that talent pool where you can do it um, and don't be afraid to, to push back on your your business leaders if um if they're looking for something that just doesn't exist or if they're looking for that purple squirrel then tell them that you know say hey this is either going to take longer to fill and extend our timeline or we need to widen these requirements to to fill this quickly so let me pause right there. And is there any questions on who to target? Um, so Dan wants to know a little bit more with respect to talent insights. So if you could share a little bit more about uh, how, what exactly is talent insights and how can someone as a recruiter improve on that? Yeah, great question. Um, Talent Insights, it's a newer tool on LinkedIn. Um, it's uh, under the, the LinkedIn Recruiter tab. Um, in order to get access to it, recruiters actually have to pass a test, uh, which I hadn't passed a test since college, so it was a little intimidating. Um, and you actually have to go to like a testing center. Um, so it's a little intense and I did have to study for it. Even though I've been a recruiter and used LinkedIn for years, um, there's a bunch of like small nuances in LinkedIn that I actually didn't know. Um, but once you pass the test, then it basically gives you access to anyone who's on LinkedIn and to draw large trends. Um, it's very, very cool tool. You probably YouTube uh, videos on, um, on LinkedIn Insights, but it tells you things like total addressable market. You can look at the US, you can narrow it down to like US or different countries and see even specific cities which have a high concentration of whatever talent you're looking for. Um, you can find insights on pay. Um, uh, you can search certain, certain skills or languages, whatever you want to do, and you can literally see the total market of people that are on LinkedIn. Um, so it's a, it's a really cool tool just to, to understand is the talent that I'm looking for, does it exist or do we need to grow it internally, things like that. You can just make large decisions. I've seen um, groups decide where to launch new locations based on where the concentration of talent is. Um, so it's a really powerful tool. Good question. Okay, perfect. So I guess uh, that answers your question, Dan. Uh, we have another a couple of more questions. So Daniel is asking, uh, how could I understand the tech market better? Good question. Um, so what I would recommend is Talent Insights is a good one. Uh, Glassdoor can give you large trends around comp and, and benefits and things like that, pros and cons of each companies. Um, I would just look at, you know, who are the largest companies in your area? Who are your direct competitors? And just Google them or look them up on LinkedIn. Um, and kind of just start building a list. It sounds funny, but I have a OneNote that I just keep full of competitive knowledge. When I find out, you know, what a title is at a different company um, that matches a title that I recruit for, then I'll write that down. Or keywords, things like that. Anything that will help me, I just keep a running list on, on OneNote. Um, I read a lot of articles too. Um, so it just makes you a more powerful and knowledgeable recruiting expert. Good question. Okay, perfect. Yep. So we have a couple of more questions, so I'll try to club them together. Uh, so a few people are asking if the LinkedIn Talent Insights is free or does it cost some money? 
It's a good question. Um, uh, Microsoft owns LinkedIn, so I, I don't know if we maybe get it for free, but uh, I'll I'll look into that and and get back to you. I'm actually not sure. Okay, one last question before we move on. This is from Yilin, and the question is regarding a purple squirrel search. How do you convince the hiring manager, that is the CEO, that the salary budget needs to be increased? Um, I would show them data, hard data. You know, pull it up from LinkedIn Insights can give you that data. Glassdoor, um, you know, CEOs and engineering leaders, they're data people. So um, don't just complain like, hey, we don't pay enough. Um, bring that data. Perfect. So I guess we can move on. And the question that we've not answered, we have a dedicated Q&A session at the end. We'll try to make sure that we answer each of the questions. Awesome. Over to you, Dominic. All right, next W, when to pitch, always, right? Always be closing. Um, the point of that here is I see a lot of recruiters who don't do a good job selling throughout the process. They wait till the very end. And um, I think of recruiting a lot like dating. Uh, so bear with me with this analogy, but you know, you wouldn't propose to someone and without selling them first, right? On why you're cool and why they should be with you forever. You know, if you're giving someone a ring, you should probably know whether or not they're going to say yes or no at the end, right? So sell from the very beginning. So let's go through these one by one. The initial outreach. Um, I'll stick with that dating analogy. This initial outreach, the point of it is to pique their interest enough so that they want to talk to you or go on a date with you, whatever. In this case, it's you're trying to convince them to have a phone call HR screen with you. Um, my husband's in sales. He calls this clickbait. Um, I just say do something to to incentivize them to talk to you um second piece there the hr screen i don't immediately start grilling a candidate on questions and trying to evaluate will they fit my requirements or not i spend the first 10 to 15 minutes trying to understand what's important to them and selling them before i ask them a single question of uh, an evaluation question that is um third bullet here is coach your teams how to sell during the tech screens and loops um recruiters can sell and be great sellers but if the team is not selling through the process that's the team that they're actually going to be working with so them being good sellers is almost more important than recruiters being good good sellers um you know it's a buyer's market so if a candidate gets grilled through a tech screen uh but doesn't really understand why it's a cool team to join they may not move on to loop with you if they come on site and they get grilled all day um, you know, they may not accept your offer. You need to show them why you're a cool team to join and why they should take your team's offer over any of the competitors. Um, and, you know, a lot of engineering managers and leaders, sometimes they're introverts, sometimes um, they don't know how to sell. Um, sometimes, you know, they've worked for a company for a long time, like 25 years, and they don't understand the competitive landscape. And it's your job as a recruiter to coach them on how to sell. Um, and the pieces that you pick up on what's motivating them to look in the, those initial outreaches and the screens, you need to relay that information to the team so they can help sell on that too. Um, and another thing too is throughout this time, I'm getting pulse questions from, from the candidate. You know, I'm asking questions like, does this role sound interesting? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Or are you meh? If they're meh, then you probably haven't sold them well enough and the, they might fall out somewhere in, in the process. Um, the on-site kickoff, you know, when you're prepping a candidate for, for the loop, it's a great opportunity to sell and again, get a, a pulse check. You know, if there's multiple companies that they're interviewing with, I ask them, you know, where does Microsoft rank? Are we your first choice, your last choice, or are we somewhere in the middle? If they're somewhere in the middle, then I know we need to do a good job of selling them while they're on site or maybe be a little bit more aggressive with compensation. Um, at the end, obviously, you want to close them at the end. Um, that's kind of a given. Uh, let me let me start uh, stop right here. Pause again. Any questions on when to, to pitch? Yes, so we have a couple of questions. Um, so this question is from Matt and he's asking when it comes to initial outreach, what do you find is an effective written opening first message? 
I actually use pretty much the same one for all candidates. Don't tell candidates this because <laughs> they probably want to feel like a special flower. Um, but I have actually changed how I source. So again, I'm I'm recruiting kind of director level candidates and I put all the candidates into a project first and a LinkedIn project and I have the hiring manager grade them. You know, in projects how they can grade great, good or ignore and they can leave comments. So I'm only reaching out to candidates that I know the team is interested in. So I'm not sending in in mail like, hey, would you maybe be interested in Microsoft? My subject line is Microsoft wants to interview you for X role. Um, and then in the body of it, I use the comments that the hiring manager gave me to make a custom mail. Um, you know, if they said, oh, I really like this person because they have, you know, deep domain knowledge in, you know, web services at scale, then I'll say that in my in mail, you know, I'll say, I'll name drop the leader, you know, this leader is was interested in this skill of yours, and thinks that this could be an exciting next step to your career for X reason. Um, do you want to set up a call? Um, sometimes if it's a high level candidate, I'll actually skip the recruiter call and move them straight to a hiring manager call to um, just save time and kind of keep up momentum. And then I'll coach the, the leader on how to handle that call. Um, kind of depends on the situation, but my, my, uh, my most effective subject line is, we want to interview you for X role. Perfect. So, okay, a few people are asking about the fourth point in the presentation that is on-site kickoff. If you could yeah. share a little bit more about what exactly it means and how can people inculcate such a practice in their um, daily lives. So, um, at micro, this is probably a Microsoft specific thing, but we do a prep call or we meet with the, the candidate on site as the first meeting, um, either or. Um, and so just going over logistics, um, you know, questions they have, giving them some interview tips. Um, and then I usually kind of get a pulse check there and, um, and do a little bit of selling. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just a meeting before an on site loop. And what a loop is, um, you know, how my company recruits is we bring candidates on site just for one day out of efficiency and we have them meet everyone in the process in one day so then we can make kind of an offer no offer decision um in one day the candidate only has to take one day off okay so uh, we have more questions coming in so should we take them right now domino or should we um, address them at the end yeah let's leave them to the end so we can get through the the good stuff um okay Cool, so the how, so this is where it gets important, right? That first bullet is the most important bullet. And I probably should have like bolded it, underlined, maybe made like a whole slide of just that word because it's that important. And it's the number one mistake I see recruiters make when closing. Uh, recruiters love to talk and I see them just immediately go in sell mode and, and just kind of sell anything and everything. Like they're throwing darts at a dart board and um, it doesn't work. You know, uh, I started off actually after being a pilot, I did a short stint in sales. And I remember my first sales interview and they asked me to sell them a pen. And I bombed that question because I was like, oh, it's a great pen, look at the color and blah, blah, blah. And why I answered it wrong is I didn't ask what the customer wanted in a pen. You know, were they looking for quality? Were they looking for, you know, a how the pen looks or, you know, a specific color of ink? You know, I didn't ask the questions of why and what they were looking for. So number one thing, listen um, before you before you start pitching. You know, if you're talking to a 21 year old candidate who's single, don't pat, don't pitch backup daycare and maternity leave. You know, um, just listen to what's important to them before you pitch. Second point is be authentic. People can tell when you're being fake. You know, you don't want to be like an OxyClean commercial or give some canned answer because people know. And um, just talk to people like they're real human and, and be authentic. The, I, I train a lot of new recruiters at Microsoft on how to close. And the number one question I ask before I even start training them is, why did you come to Microsoft? And, um, and then when they give me their answer, it's always very different answers actually. I say, use that, you know, use that example. Because um, candidates can tell when you're being real. Uh, and, and I also ask them because it gives me new ideas on how to close too. But um, 
you know, my, my why of why I'm at my current company is I'm a working mom. And so flexibility is really important to me. And at my company right now, I'm able to work from home when I need it. My hours are flexible. It allows me to be a good mom and have a successful career. Um, you know, another reason I, that keeps me here is the people. And I know that sounds like a, a kind of a cliche answer, but the recruiting leadership team here, they really care about people. You know, I've seen, you know, some of my peers go through health issues or divorce. And, you know, at some companies, if you dropped balls, you'd be fired if you didn't hit goal. And that doesn't happen here. The leadership team has your back and gives you a chance to bounce back. And they look at employees long term and they truly care. Um, so I feel like I'm, I'm coming to work with buddies um, and, and people can just tell when you're being real. And, you know, those answers that I just gave, I didn't mention compensation once, if you notice. Um, so just, just be real and authentic. Third bullet here is uncover the candidate motivators. If you can get good at this, it's a game changer. And the sooner you uncover what's motivating them or triggering them to look, the better. Um, because then you can just sell on that throughout the entire pro process. You can teach your teams to sell on that. Um, and sometimes candidates will come out and tell you what the, what's motivating them to look. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes they don't even know yet. Um, so just kind of peeling that back and, and understanding. Some common um, motivators I've noticed are, you know, they're looking for more money or increase in title, or they want better work-life balance, or to work on cooler technology, or, you know, culture is a big one. Maybe they hate their manager, um, or they want a new challenge or more growth path, or, you know, they're commuting and it's sucking their soul. You know, whatever their motivator is, figure it out and sell that and how they can have whatever thing they're looking for at your company. Um, all right, I know I went on a tangent there, but that one's important. Uh, Fourth bullet here is simplify your company and the role. Um, at big companies, sometimes it can be hard for candidates to wrap their head around. You know, I work at a big four company. It's 120,000 people, maybe even more now. I don't know. You should probably know that. <laughs> but um, what I find works well at large companies is breaking it down. So um, I kind of have three pitches. You know, I'll talk about why Microsoft, why that particular org, and then why that specific team or role. Um, the why Microsoft, you know, be authentic again and be you. Why that team, you know, customize like a good, um, you know, what's cool about that org. Um, and then with the team, I work with so many different teams that I could never remember or memorize all the different teams. So I just take really good notes when I sync with, with hiring managers for the first time and I ask them, what's cool about your role? Why would someone want to leave our top competitor to come to your, your team and your role? And then I write it down and I say it to the candidate and I have all those notes for future roles they open up. Um, another thing with simplifying the company and the role is sometimes uh, engineering leaders will use a lot of internal acronyms and you lose external candidates. They, they can't follow um, and it's easy to lose external candidates. I, um, here's a horror story. I had a candidate a few years ago when I was recruiting for e-commerce team and he went through a whole interview day, five interviews. And at the end, I was calling and getting feedback from him. He didn't understand what the team did. And I cleared it up for him in two words. I was like, it's an e-commerce team. But the team had gone so in the weeds and so deep into tech and acronyms that they lost the candidate. And he came out of the interview day being confused. So simplify as much as you can. Uh, you know, pretend that you're explaining what your team does to my four year or three year old daughter. She's almost four. Um, you know, break it down, simplify things um, and try to use industry wide terms. You know, if your titling is kind of funky and isn't the same as the external market, use those common terms and, and titles that the candidates would understand. Um, pitch to what candidates care about. Again, pitch to those motivators. Can't say that enough. And don't make assumptions. Um, I'll tell you about a mistake that I personally made. Uh, this is uh, a couple years ago and it was a high level candidate and she had taken six months off of work and she had mentioned that. Um, and so in my head, I assumed that she was on maternity leave. And so, you know, I naturally started pitching things like backup daycare and how great our maternity leave was and work life balance and flexibility. And she actually stopped me at one point and was like, 
just so you know, I didn't have a kid. I took a sabbatical to travel and I was humiliated and I've never made that mistake since. I make sure that I am 100% accurate on what's motivating the candidate before I start selling stuff. Um, last point there is check in frequently and keep a tight pulse on, on where a candidate's head is at. Um, again, back to the dating analogy, if you go dark on a candidate, you lose momentum and they lose excitement. Recruiting is all about momentum. Um, you know, if you stall out at any point in the process, then they lose that excitement and you're in danger of them, you know, going somewhere else to, to get an offer. Um, so having really fast processes is key also to, to landing top talent. So um, I'm a big fan of online assessments like, um, like Hacker Earth, for example, to, to speed up that interview process so that you don't lose momentum. Oh, sorry, I kind of went on first. Uh, any questions on this page before I move on? I know I, I get kind of excited about closing. Mm, okay, so we have a couple of questions. Um, okay, so are there any particular questions you use to get at candidate motivators? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll kind of give them a compliment usually like, hey, it looks like, you know, your resume is so, or your LinkedIn is so impressive and it looks like things are going pretty well. Why'd you take my call? Or, you know, why'd you agree to meet with me? And um, then I can kind of get a sense of, you know, how excited they are. Um, or, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll ask, you know, uh, are you actively looking? Is it, did you just respond to me because of, um, you know, the company I'm at or was the role interesting? So I'll just kind of pry lightly. Um, sometimes I'll flat out ask, you know, what's triggering you to look, you know? Uh, is, and if they can't come up with something, sometimes I'll feed them a couple common ones. Like, you know, are you looking for, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll kind of take educated guesses. Like if a company is not known for work-life balance, maybe I'll say, you know, are you looking for work-life balance or, you know, growth or I'll kind of like feed them some common ones just because again, I've done my homework and I know the market pretty well. Um, so I might, I might feed them some to see if that triggers them to talk. Uh, sometimes candidates don't know that yet though. I remember one time I interviewed and um, I was doing well at my current company and I, but I took the call and I went through the whole process and it wasn't until the end that I realized what was wrong at my current role. And I actually ultimately decided to stay and, um, you know, kind of work at that there. But sometimes candidates interview and they don't know. Um, so giving them ideas and putting things in their head to try to help them figure it out can help too. Perfect. So that answers that question. Uh, one more question before we move on. Uh, what do you do or say in order to maintain frequent contact during the hiring process? Good question. Um, again, I don't do canned answers and I try to give them, I try to be as transparent as possible. So um, for instance, like um, if uh, let's say scheduling the on-site loop is taking a long time. I'll say, hey, you know, two people from this team are traveling internationally and it's just been kind of tough to schedule. Don't take our delay as lack of interest in you. They're still really excited about you. Just wanted to give you a heads up that this may take a week longer than normal. Or, um, you know, uh, let's say another time I think that things stall is if the team is making up their mind between candidates. Um, you know, after they've interviewed that time after you've interviewed and they don't know the answer yet is like one of the most crucial because it's nerve wracking for the candidate. So sometimes I'll just check in and say, hey, you know, high level, you know, your feedback looks pretty good. I'm still waiting to hear the final decision. Um, the team said they'd let me know by Tuesday or, you know, whatever. Um, so even if I don't have an update, I think candidates just like to hear that they haven't been forgotten about and um, and that they're still in the running for the role. Because sometimes candidates, you know, if you don't check in, they assume like, oh, they went with someone else. All right, let's uh, move on. To perfect. Yep, so we'll move on. And we have a lot of questions, but again, we'll take them at the end. Cool, cool. All right, so let's go over some of the challenges with closing. Number one, titles and leveling. 
Um, this one can be a tricky one because to some candidates, title is more important than compensation. Um, you know, I've had candidates tell me that um, like in certain cultures, taking a step back can be seen as failure. Um, so it's, it's a really big deal to some candidates. I mean, to me, I don't know, you could call me recruiting peasant and I wouldn't really care as long as I liked the job. But to a lot of candidates, it's, it's really important. The number one thing I try to do uh, at offer stage when title is an issue is I try to separate the issues of title and compensation. I don't try to tackle them both at once. And I tackle title first. And how I do that is, um, number one, I give them context as to why. So if, um, let's say they applied for a senior dev role, but the team leveled them as software engineer too. I explain why they made that decision. Um, I give examples about how titles are relative. You know, Microsoft is a 120,000 person company. They're big and they're relatively flat. And so, um, you know, I, I give examples of past hires, not specific ones, but I'll say, hey, I recently hired a director of engineering from this large retail company. They leveled as principal lead here. Or um, another thing I do is I'll use myself as an example, and I think that that builds trust with candidates because um, it's me being a little vulnerable. So I'll say, hey, before coming to Microsoft, I was at a small to medium sized company and I was team lead and had just been promoted to manager. I started at X level, which some people thought was too conservative. Um, and you know, it wasn't because at that time I didn't have tech recruiting experience. I only had sales recruiting experience. Um, and in hindsight, that level was the best thing that ever happened to me in my career because it set me up for success. I was able to exceed expectations versus, um, you know, it's always better to exceed expectations because you'll make more money with bonuses. Um, you'll get that, um, sometimes you'll get like a couple promos under your belt and look like a rising star versus if you come in slightly over leveled and you stay there for a while and maybe don't hit expectations, then people start wondering what's wrong with you and you don't have the same long-term career trajectory. Um, I'm always a big fan of exceed expectations. Um, so what else with titling and leveling? Um, if I can't overcome this one on my own, then I'll loop in the hiring manager to do a sell call. And they'll go over again, why they made that decision. Um, they'll talk about how, um, let's use that same software engineer two versus senior. They'll talk about how they're gonna coach and mentor and get them to the senior level. You know, they'll pinpoint what exactly is missing. Like so a, a common one is, Maybe um, they're a senior at a smaller company, but they haven't worked at, at the crazy scale that Microsoft is. So um, they say, hey, we just need to get you that experience and then you know, you'll be there. And I think that that growth path conversation, it goes over and lands a lot better with the hiring manager or even a skip manager versus a recruiter. Because I think sometimes um, candidates see recruiters as like salespeople like that we're just trying to get it done. Um, so uh, I think it's a little more impactful coming from the team. All right, big fours versus startups. So I know we have people from large companies on the call and startups, so I'll kind of go both angles here. Um, I find that the two biggest differences between the two are culture, uh, or I guess draws, I can't, why candidates are drawn to one or, or the other is culture and the pre-IPO stock dream. Um, so if you're at a startup, sell the culture, sell how it's a tight-knit community, how they'll have a huge impact and they'll own a big scope of work and be able to wear many hats. Um, you know, Talk about how it's a fast process and you can advance really quickly because uh, it's a small company. Um, sell that pre-IPO stock, you know, give specifics whenever you can, sell the fuck out of that you know, pre-IPO stock, it's a big deal. Uh, if you're at a big four, then do the opposite, right? What I do, because I'm at a big four, is if a candidate, I try to pinpoint what's appealing to a startup from a candidate's perspective, from this particular candidate, what's motivating them to talk to a startup and Microsoft, because they're very different experiences, right? Um, so if it's culture that they're looking for, then how I pitch it is, I align them with a team who has kind of a startup culture, right? Who is a newer, you know, group within Microsoft. Um, 
For example, for the past year, I recruited for developer relations. It was a brand new org that didn't exist two years ago. Um, it was really fast paced, not a lot of process, huge impact. Um, and so how I sold it is you get all the perks of a startup, but you get the stability and the resources of Microsoft. So it's the best of both worlds. Um, and then for the pre-IPO stock thing, I obviously sell the, the stability factor of a big four, um, but also I, I gently poke holes in, in the pre-IPO stock dream. My husband hates this because my husband actually works at a startup. He works at OfferUp. Um, and so uh, he hates this line whenever he hears me on a, on a call with a candidate. But one thing I say is I try to be like a consultant and I say, hey, you know, that pre-IPO stock could be worth something someday, but right now it's not worth anything. It's worth zero dollars. Um, and I go over, you know, some of the possible pitfalls, you know, um, some, comp some startups fail, some never IPO, some IPO at a lo lower price than um, what they think it will. Um, I talk about, you know, strike price. Um, will you have the cash to front that at the time that they, um, you can cash out on that, that IPO. So I, I gently, and I don't trash talk other companies, but I just give candidates some other things to consider, kind of like a, cons a consultant. All right, compensation. I feel like this box I could do a whole presentation on because um, there's a lot to talk about here. Um, so first off, talk early about compensation, get the candidates um, expectations early um, so that you're aligning them with a role that fits their expectations. If you don't talk early and you align them with the wrong role, you've wasted everybody's time. Um, I know that sometimes candidates won't tell you, but I, I explain to them why I'm asking um, and for that reason. Um, if for some reason you don't have compensation at the very end, I don't give out blind offers. I won't give an offer if I don't have some sort of idea of what the expectation is. Um, usually if it's at the end and I don't have compensation, I try to warm them up with some kind of, I'll give them the news that they're getting an offer and that I'm trying to get compensation approved. I'll give them some sort of softball, like, you know, every candidate is different. Some prefer, care a lot about base salary. Some care a lot about stock. Some just care about total compensation. You know, what's important to you out of that? Um, and, you know, it doesn't really matter what they say. I mean, I take note because sometimes you get interesting things like, hey, I'm trying to buy a house. So a signing bonus would be really cool for a down payment. Um, and then after that, I followed up with a more detailed question like, you know, what's your expectation or what are you targeting for base salary? What are you targeting for total comp? Um, and uh, sometimes they'll tell you, sometimes they won't. If they don't tell me, I try again and asking in a different way. Um, and I tell them I'm asking because I don't want to accidentally lowball them and insult them. I want to make sure that our first offer is a strong one and one that they're excited about. Um, and usually by that part in the process, they start to trust me. Um, you have to build that trust along the process. Um, another thing with compensation that I've switched up recently, I got it from our director of exec recruiting, Marty actually, is um, I roll out benefits that are applicable to them, ones that they would care about, not all of them, not the, the dartboard analogy. Um, and the reason I do benefits first is once they hear compensation, they stop listening. Um, second thing I changed since talking to Marty is I give an idea of total comp first, an estimated total comp, and then I break it down, you know, base, salary, bonus, et cetera. Um, and why I do that is Let's say you start with just the base salary and you're lower than one of the other offers. Again, they're going to sense that lower number and stop listening for the rest of the numbers. Um, and then um, also just total comp is a bigger number in general and it's more exciting. Um, another thing, when you're estimating total comp, if you have a bonus structure, don't estimate it off the max bonus because you're, you want to under promise and over deliver or else the person's going to leave, right? If you promise them significantly more money and they don't make it, they're going to trip in six months, a year, something like that, and probably hate you. And um, for me, I work with a lot of people managers is who I recruit. So I know I'm going to have to work with them and hire for them to their team and see them in the hallways. So I am super honest and super transparent about what's realistic. I, I talk about max, but I, I don't, I tell them for budgeting to use a lesser number. 
Um, all right, deadlines. Uh, I know we're kind of running short on time here, so I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Deadlines, some recruiters use them, some don't. I, I do in some cases, it depends. For more senior candidates, um, I'm a little more loose with deadlines, um, but I uh, another thing here is I try not to live and die by one candidate. I target to have three good candidates on every role I recruit for. And why I do that is sometimes candidates you think will be really good, they end up sucking in the interview. Sometimes they take another offer. And so you wanna have those backup candidates. And so how I position deadlines is I say, hey, you're the team's first choice, but um, you know, uh, cause sometimes they try to stall like, hey, can I wait a month? Cause I have some other stuff going on, which usually is an indicator that you're not their number one choice, by the way. Um, so I'll, I'll just position it like, hey, they really are excited about you, but this is an urgent need on the team. And so we need an answer by X date so that we don't put the team in a bad position and, um, uh, you know, lose out on all candidates and have to start out from fresh. And most of the time candidates get it, right? Um, multiple offers. Every, every company has a different compensation structure. And so sometimes it can be confusing to you know, compare apples to apples because it's not, every, everything's different. Um, what I do, and people tease me, is I have whiteboards out there. I map it out and I, I literally break down each company and I break down base, stock, cash, bonus, total comp. And I always compare total comp to total comp. And then sell on whatever, wherever you're winning. If you're winning on base salary, so, hey, cash is king. That's what's guaranteed. And we go and, you know, buy a house. Like, that's what they look at. If your total comp is higher, then sell that, you know, just sell whatever you're leading in. Um, and, and sell, don't only sell on comp, sell on all the other stuff and, and other motivators. Um, relocation. This one, it um, is interesting. Um, usually, if a candidate has to reload, um, I end up being a little bit more aggressive on the offer. Um, if they're going from a more expensive area to a cheaper area, then obviously that's an easier sell, like California to Washington. We have no state tax and cost of living is cheaper. And I send calculators like numbio.com so that they can do their own research and don't have to trust my word for it. Um, going, if candidates are going from a cheaper cost of living to a higher one, that's sometimes a harder conversation. Um, the first thing I check is making sure we're, we're comparing apples to apples. Like if they live in a cheaper suburb and not in a big city, make sure that they're not comparing their cheap suburb to downtown Seattle, right? Uh, give them a, a cheaper area to look at, like, um, you know, maybe Woodenville or, um, you know, Kenmore or Bothell, something that's comparable to what they're at right now. Junior versus senior candidates. Um, senior candidates seem to be more focused on like long-term growth. They're not as price sensitive, comp sensitive is what I mean by that. Um, you can sell things like work-life balance. A lot of times they have families, they care more about benefits. Um, junior candidates are a little bit more compensation focused. Uh, you know, some candidates try to take offers that are clearly not as good for five bucks less. Uh, you know, if you do get a decline in that situation, it probably wasn't a good long-term candidate anyways, because they, again, will probably a trip a year from now for, you know, five, up, five bucks more. Um, junior candidates also care a lot more about impact on the community and things they like to know that their work is meaningful. I um, have read a lot of articles about this lately, and um, a lot of the articles say that most millennials and Gen Z will take less money if they feel like their work is doing good or impactful. So kind of make sure to, to intersect and weave in the impact. Um, previous employee or friend who got a better offer. Uh, this I'm sure other people have had this objection before. I always tell the candidate, it depends on how you interview. Your interview performance is what dictates, you know, level and offer. Um, you know, it's a big company. And so um, certain skill sets are more valuable, um, you know, maybe, interview uh, is is different. You didn't interview as well, or, you know, maybe their skill set was really valuable to that one particular team. All right, I'm going to skip questions just because we only have two quick slides left. Um, where, our last W of the day is where to contact tech talent. 
Um, recruiters a lot of time like to talk and so they want to hop on the call all the time and you can you know sense where a candidate is at a lot of times. Many software engineers and tech people are introverts and so um, they prefer a lot of times email and text. I was um, on a panel recently with um, an engineering leader and he said I would love it if recruiters text me more versus forcing me to get on a call. So um, that really stuck with me. And since then, I've asked, what's your preference? You know, do you want me to follow up the email or call you or text? And when they tell me their preference, I follow it. I take a little note in my OneNote and I follow it. All right, so in closing, uh, all this stuff is stuff I've learned through, again, trial and error, but from other people. Um, you know, I, I probably should have had like a work cited page of all the great recruiters who have taught me stuff or, over the years. Uh, but uh, the, my biggest advice is how to grow this skill set. Learn from your peers. Find the best closer or recruiter you know. Learn from them. Um, listen. Ask them if they you can shadow on one of their calls or if you can if they they can walk you through how they do it. Um, hallway chats is where I pick up new things all the time. Um, and don't be prideful about it, you know, ask like, hey, I'm struggling with this situation. Have you had anything that works here? Um, yeah, so I know we don't have too much time for questions. There was one last poll for you, um, but we can maybe do the poll and questions at the same time. Does that work our best? Yeah, that works perfectly fine. And uh, so I guess you can have a look at the questions while I run the poll. So that you have an idea about, uh, I, I see that most of our questions have been answered in your previous slide, because uh, most of the questions were around compensation and senior or junior employees. So I guess more or less we've covered most of them. So we'll okay. quickly run this poll. Cool. Any questions? And um, I don't know about our Baz's schedule, but I, I can go a little bit longer if if people have questions for me on you know things that you're challenging being challenged with or you know struggles in closing let me know yeah i mean oh, we can, we can stretch this session a little longer maybe 10 15 minutes extra yeah. so that yeah. we can take up all the questions and you might notice that one of my questions is the same i ask candidates you know was this that yes no meh so i'm glad that most of you found it valuable and whoever that one percent is you must be an expert already. <laughs> I guess. Cool. Any questions for me at all? Uh, okay. So one question that we have is, uh, if you already know what the compensation of a candidate is already, how would that cons that be considered in rolling out a new offer? How would that be considered? Yes. As um, in, um, what is the yeah. usual? appraisal that you have in your mind yeah that is a lot easier number one um if you feel like you're gonna come in low i always prime candidates um and what i mean by priming is um you know i'll say hey you know that's way higher than our average offer you know i'm gonna try my very best but just a heads up base might be a little bit low but i can make a compelling total comp uh, uh, offer um and and why i do that is if you prime them a little bit and kind of meet or temper their expectations then um they're not as surprised when you give the numbers and they're not as disappointed perfect so uh, okay guys so this is one poll that we have from hackers and and um, i'll be sending out a mail as well you can try our platform for free for 14 days try it out um, maybe you might find it really useful for your tech hiring so if you say yes to this i'll reach out to you via email with your credentials for logging in and you can use the platform for free cool so moving on to the next questions um okay what is the main skill difference in tech market between a junior and a senior candidate Good question, um, and it gets asked a lot. Um, I can only answer this for Microsoft. Um, um, and again, this is, uh, I, I guess I can't for all of Microsoft, but the things that I've noticed as, as a recruiter are, um, when it comes to software engineer one and two, there's a lot of emphasis on being a strong coder. When it comes to senior, um, they're looking for obviously strong coding designs, but are, sorry, strong coding, but also 
design skills become more important. They're also looking for leadership skills a lot of times. Can you mentor more junior devs? Do you have more business acumen? Like a lot of times they expect seniors to maybe know more than one way to answer the problem, but have a business opinion on what's best. Um, and then another thing I noticed a lot for Microsoft is that question of scale. You know, have you worked at on large scale before? Um, yeah, that's kind of the difference that I differences that I usually see. Perfect. So um, one question is, uh, what is the website you refer to for cost of weight comparison? Oh yeah, it's numbio.com. Uh, N U M B E O.com. And it's really cool. You can type in any city and then your city and, um, or, you know, if they live in a suburb right now, compare it to a, a nearby suburb and you can send them the link and they can look at is housing, housing differences or food and everything like that. Cause sometimes people think too, when they're moving from cheaper to more expensive, they blow it up in their head. Like it's going to be, you know, 200 times more expensive. Um, so sometimes it like brings them back to earth. Um, sometimes it proves that really cost of living isn't that much more things like that. It's a really helpful tool. Okay. Um, okay. So I've clubbed a couple of questions. So the, these questions are around what does, what matters more to the candidate, the job title or the compensation? It depends on on the candidate. Um, it really, really does. Um, every candidate's different. Um, I, interesting thing though, outside of, of title and compensation, which are sometimes things that recruiters can't control, um, we had a speaker come to Microsoft recently from Gallup polling. And the number one thing outside of compensation that candidates cared about was flexibility, um, which I found really interesting. Um, flexibility to be able to work from home or hours and things like that. And the thing that stuck with me about that is that's something that any size company can offer, any manager really can offer a candidate. But um, as far as comp or title, it just depends on the candidate. Sometimes it's a cultural thing. Sometimes it's like a personal thing. Um, every person's different. So yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. You Usually compensation, but I'd say if I was to like make a generic guesstimate, but um, but for a lot of candidates, it's the other. Perfect. So that answers the question. Um, a lot of people are still asking about the name of the soft, the, the website that you mentioned. So maybe you can share it with me personally and I can write uh, it down for everyone in the mail that I send out. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely do that. Okay, so... Okay, we've covered most of the part. The one slide that you had, the slide number seven, actually covered most of the questions. Okay. Was, uh, that was an in-depth one. But still, I'm looking for questions that might have not been answered. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, I guess I guess we've covered everything. Awesome. Well, I am so thankful that you decided to join, and I hope it was a valuable use of time. It sounds like for most of you, except for that 1%, it was a, a good use of time. Um, <laughs> I, I guess he, he, whoever that one person was, uh, they pressed it by mistake. I mean, the mouse might have moved and they wanted to click on yes, but uh, sadly they clicked on no. Yeah, maybe it's like my my husband trolling me or something. I don't know. <laughs> that is also possible. So thank you very much, Domina. I mean, we we were glad to have you, and um, the session was informative for me as well. I mean, I usually am not recruiting, and I'm not from a recruiting background, but being a part of this session really gave me a lot of insights about closing a particular tech position in general, and. Uh, I mean, we're, we're really grateful to you for accepting the invitation that we sent out for you being a part of to this webinar session with Hacker Earth. And thank you so much. I mean, I fall short of words when I have to, you know, um, praise you for today's session. So yep, thank you is all I have. Cool. Thank you so much for the invite. Hope to talk soon. And thank you everyone for listening. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our attendees today for taking out time out of their busy schedules in being a part of today's session. And uh, we'll be sharing the recording of this session with all of you. So don't worry if you missed out on 
certain things during the presentation. We'll make sure you have this recording along with the slides. Also, uh, one more thing, we would love to have we would we would love to have uh, feedback from all our attendees. You can tag at the rate hacker earth and at the rate domina with your comments about today's session, be it Twitter or LinkedIn. And we'd love to see your feedback there. Once again, thank you, Domina, and to all our attendees. And hope you have a great day ahead. Bye-bye.